firstly, I'd like to, to thank all those involved within the, the research um, services within the Assembly and their partners in Queen's University, um, the University of Ulster and Open University for all the, the good work they do on these um, knowledge exchange seminars, which um, have become a, a frequent occurrence here in, in Stormont. And um, I know that there's great interest both in the, the political um, sphere in what is discussed at these seminars, but also in, in academic worlds and, and, and outside of those two environments. So it's good to see um, these events taking place because it is important that particularly we as, as politicians, as, as policy makers, um, are informed about what's happening in the world. Um, because in order to make the right decisions, in order to, to, to govern as best we can, we need to be informed fully as to, to what's actually happening in the wider world. So these seminars are, are very interesting and very useful. Um, and now I'll go back to the speech that I was told to read out. Um, the issues associated with migration have seen much debate in the media as we enter 2014. Restrictions on Bulgarian and Romanian workers um, were lifted on, on the 1st of January, and on the 3rd of January, the Italian Navy rescued over 1,000 migrants from North Africa in one day. Migration as a, a global phenomenon has been an integral factor in the economic, social, and cultural development of societies throughout history. The earliest vernacular, that's a big word for me, the earliest vernacular literature of this island also has a theme of arrival and settlement, although the most recent past has been associated with emigration. Um, but I think if you, if you watched any of the documentaries um, that were done the last number of years about where the people of, of Ireland originated from, it, it was very, very interesting. Um, and I know that I uh, learned quite a bit from that. Um, but I'm not answering any questions at the end, so I didn't learn that much. Economic and social developments in the last two decades, however, have seen a trend of inward migration to the island of Ireland. Um, this has been enhanced by the enlargement of the European Union eastwards in 2004 which saw unprecedented numbers of, of new EU citizens exercising their mobility rights to work here. Um, and this brought about a flourishing of, of certain parts of our, our local economy. Um, and I know in my, my own constituency of Fermanagh and South Rhone, um, large urban centres like Dungannon um, particularly saw uh, a very welcome influx of, um, of, of migrant workers, which has really helped um, sustain the, lo the local economy in that area. Uh, these trends have brought challenges to a region unused to significant exposure to other cultures, uh, but also challenges to the new arrivals themselves in seeking to integrate into a society that is itself very divided um, in many ways. While immigration policy is a, an accepted matter and it's not something that the, the local assembly or the, the, the executive have um, much say on, there is a range of devolved policy areas relevant to this broader theme, such as ensuring um, people are treated fairly in the workplace, um, that's, that adequate standards are set in housing policy and that discrimination is prohibited on the grounds of ethnic or religious difference or providing high quality health care to those who need it. The Department of Employment and Learning, and, and has been said I'm one of the 11 members of the Employment and Learning Scrutiny Committee, um, is responsible for the, the migrant worker strategy and it convenes the migrant worker thematic subgroup of the race relations panel. The four areas of work for the thematic subgroup are information for and about migrant workers, employment inspection and enforcement to ensure workers' rights are upheld and to address labour exploitation, research and data gathering to assist us as legislators and policymakers to make evidence-based decisions. Um, I'm hoping that's something that will improve in time as our democracy matures a bit. Um, and developing best practice to learn from each other about how best to engage with and support people who come to live and work among us. Um, in its scrutiny work, the Committee for Employment and Learning keeps a close eye on the Department's handling of these issues, for example, considering a wide range of evidence during the passage of legislation in relation to the EU Agency Workers Directive. Um, some of these issues can be complex, and migration is a constantly changing environment, so we need to be kept abreast of the, the latest developments in this field. And as I say, I'm delighted um, to welcome the contributions from, from today's presenters, and I'm looking forward to to learning an awful lot more. Um, Dr. Joanne True, a lecturer at the University of Ulster, will give us an update on the patterns of migration to, uh, to and emigration from the north, and I'm, I'm sure she's going to, to plug her book at some stage during that. Um, Drs. Anne, I'm terrible at pronunciation here, Drs. Anne Kuvonen, uh, Justina Bell, and Michael Donnelly of Queen's University will remind us, um, echoing the often quoted words of the, the Swiss playwright and novelist Max Frisk, that we do not just recruit workers, but people with personal, social and family dimensions to their lives and pressures associated with migration and integration that impact on them. 
and Dr Ruth McAravey from Queen's University was to speak about some of the challenges associated with demographic change in our society, but is unfortunately unwell. However, her paper she was to give is included in your pack, um, which you can take a look at in your own time. So you're all very welcome to today's seminar. Um, we look forward um, to hear what um, the presenters have to say, but also encourage people to participate in the, the question and answer discussion that will follow the presentations. One of the things I want to talk about, you can see that the name of my presentation, or the title of my presentation, is called Lost Generations with a Question Mark, um, Taking the Longer View on Northern Ireland Migration. So why is this important? Because there's, and some of you may have seen um, the Nick um, Robinson's sh uh, Truth About Immigration program the other night on BBC Two, Fergal Keane's program last night following that on um, immigrants in uh, Ilford area of London. Um, and some of the talk in some of the in Nick's program in particular is about that kind of um, what we've seen in the media in the last week really, with the hordes are descending, the hordes are coming. Fear, panic, you know, opportunities to out racism and all kinds of craziness. When actually, if we take a longer view and remember as well that all of us, many of us in this room, no doubt, have been migrants. A lot of us have family who are migrants. Emigration is once again a huge uh, part of Northern Ireland. So uh, maybe in taking a look at all of that, um, that helps us to understand Immigration. So rather than focus just on immigration, I'm interested um, in all forms of migration. And that's why I call it migration. So that it's emigration, it's immigration, it's people coming back, return migration, it's people who move from here to uh, other places. They come in, they go out, they move back, and they go forth from various countries. And maybe they move on to a third or fourth country or a fifth country. And within that, and within Northern Ireland as well, and within Ireland and within Britain, we have lots of internal migration. So people moving between Belfast and Yorkshire. You know, that could be one of the biggest culture shocks of your life, uh, depending on your circumstances. So just understanding those issues about moving. So I'm, it's going to be fast. I'm going to fly through the main trends 90 years um, since partition, since the formation, establishment of Northern Ireland. So it's going to be quick in 20 minutes. And if you do not get the tables, don't worry, because the PowerPoint is going up on the website. And um, as well as that, and I sh this is a shameless plug, I might just, I, I've just published a book on it. Uh, and I actually have that as a slide there. Um, and that's in your pack as well. And I've put some flyers out as well, uh, which covers and has all these charts and things in it. Um, and a lot of libraries have this book as well, so you can consult it there. So I'm going to look at, first of all, recent migration trends, taking the longer view, looking at the numbers over time. Uh, why migrate? What are some of the causes of migration? It's particularly pertaining, this is pertaining very specifically to Northern Ireland. Where have people from here emigrated that have left here? Um, who are the migrants? Look, who are these people? The human face of migration is sometimes just not there in a lot of the coverage and a lot of the, even the policy documents and so on. It's hard to get at that sometimes. Um, and what, has there been a discourse of migration overall in Northern Ireland since 1921 to the present time? And are there some lessons in that for us now? So if I get through all of that, we'll be lucky. But anyway, I'll go quick. Um, in... Um, February, it's actually two years ago now, January 31st um, of 2012, <coughs> excuse me, um, I knew this would happen, um, lo, um, the programme Lost Generation, BBC Northern Ireland Spotlight, put this Lost Generation programme, and this has appeared, this term Lost Generation began to appear in the media, it also began to appear in uh, the Irish Times, uh, in various uh, types of media south of the border as well, um, this idea of lost generation. So I was fascinated by that and all the kind of flurry about that. And basically, the gist of that program was about young people from our shores who are leaving in the current period since particularly the downturn in the economy in 2008. And there were lots of things at the same time following on from that program. Uh, exodus of our middle class. Fears grow as, I just love the language, hordes of talented young uh, professionals quit Ulster to find work. Uh, but it's trying to give the human face, um, Adrian Rutherford's trying to give the human face uh, to his credit on, on, on this issue. Our brightest young talent forced to find work abroad. Now, we'll, we'll park 
at the moment, whether this is a positive thing or is, it all, is migration always positive? Is it always negative? Is it just like life and is just everything? Positive, negative, in between, some good, some bad. Probably that's the realistic idea about it. And then we had another, um, in, in 2013, another series of programs, which a lot of you probably saw, uh, and, and media following on from that, the, the Departure Diaries, which again was filming people, and also families who were leaving Northern Ireland in the last couple of years. Um, emigration draining NI communities. <coughs> Video series, Departure Diaries. And I, that was, I think, three parts. Um, and we even have things appearing, um, for example, this is right on the internet at the moment, about a fast house sale, leaving Northern Ireland, sell your home because of relocation or emigration from Northern Ireland. So emigration is a big, big feature at the moment, and we mustn't forget it. Okay, so you can see this is the, the news coverage of that uh, last April, Empty Shoes Paint Stark Picture of Emigration. And that's actually not Barry McElduff, that's a Councillor Peter Kelly in the, in the actual picture, but Barry McElduff was uh, involved in that. So... One can ask about emigration, why the silence at Stormont, as if this is true and if this is what, what Barry suggests. Um, and has this been true over time? So one asks the question, are Stormont politicians only interested in immigration? And if that's so, why is that? And we can see here some of the, 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 the general data. This is from the... Um, uh, I think this is from the uh, population estimates, the uh, mid-year report from last year, uh, as is this. And we can see that the trend for migration uh, right now, we can see the dip, and it's just begun to resume by mid-2012. Our, our statistics are always a year behind. So in, in mid-June 2013, or June 30th, 2013, we got this, the mid, up to mid-June 2012. So we won't have the next set to know what's really happened in the last year. I could talk a lifetime on data issues and flimsiness of data issues. We don't have time today, but that's something I go into a little bit in the book, and, a lot of, and Nick Robinson also went into that a little bit in his talk. It's a co complex issue, but we really don't know an awful lot about migration is essentially how it goes uh, in terms of data. But what we do know is actually we're on a, we've been on a severe dip. So let's take a look at that over the longer view. So that's, th th there's 2000 to 2012. And um, here are, um, for example, top so source countries recently arrived immigrants. So it gives you an idea from different sets of data um, who, you know, who are the main groups arriving. Um, and that includes people from the Republic of Ireland who are, who are living here and from different types of data and languages in this, according to the school census and so on. And if, but let's not forget people that are also, some of our immigrants are actually returning migrants. So they're people who maybe grew up here and they're coming back. The most recent data I have on this, because the 2011 census hasn't been released on this particular part of the census, the breakdown. But when we look at it and we see that, let's not forget, in the 2000 census, the year prior to uh, the 2000 census, that year, the number of people coming back, if we break it down, you can see they're coming from quite a lot of different places themselves. And but remembering that, according to the 2011 census, 93.4% of, of people currently resident in Northern Ireland had never lived outside Northern Ireland at all. So that's something just to keep in mind, taking the longer view. So our brightest young talent, is emigration our dirty wee secret? Do we really have, have we really lost these generations? And I'm going to take you back, way back, and we look at kind of some of the, the, the in Ulster immigration, I just had the figures for Ulster, so that would be nine counties of Ulster, but nevertheless, um, looking at the, this, we can see that the massive migrations really occurred in the 19th century, and you can see the locations. America, of course, tops the bill, and Britain comes in second. Uh, and that's, uh, that's actually North America, so it it's, it's includes Canada, which is a very heavy destination for here. We look at the figures comparatively in terms of net migration figures, Ireland and Northern Ireland. And what do we see is until the most recent decade, what we have is essentially always a negative picture. I don't want to say negative, a minus picture. So net migration is in the minus. So that means there's more people departing than, uh, than are coming in. And that includes of uh, people born here and so on. And if we look at the actual numbers, say, in, the, in, in this period, in these periods, we can see the actual kind. This is net migration figures. So this gives us an idea of the people that are essentially missing, according to some of our, you know, if we take in our, our calculation with birth and mortality and, and so on, uh, this is what the calculation is. And the preliminary figure over the last decade gives us about 38 
1,400 people in the plus. There's another estimate, actually, that puts it at 48,000. There's two sets of data that don't agree, which is very typical in migration. But even if we're talking around 50,000 people in a 10-year period, it's not really all that much. And why is there such sort of tremendous excitement and blood boiling and all these kinds of things and panic and fear, when actually we should be looking at this, I think, very positively. Um, but if we look at, again, over time, what we actually see is, we see inflow and outflow, and I'm not going to ask you to look at all of these things, but it's really a negative picture. It's mostly in the minus. We have a few years as, uh, of positivity. We have people going, positive immigration. We have people going, some of that's going over, back and forth over the border with the south, the south of Ireland. Don't forget those people. Um, so actually, if we look back further years, and I'm sorry this chart is a wee, bit, a wee bit scattered. It's just the way I couldn't get it to sit on these templates. But you can still see it's a completely minus picture if we go back further. So that's just taking a look at it in sort of more recent times from about the 1980s. But why migrate? So why are people actually migrating, whether they're coming here or whether they're leaving here? And if we go back to the 1920s, what we look at is, what we see really is um, um, problems, really a legacy from, from what we're now commemorating, um, World War I and its legacy. And part of its legacy was huge emigration from Northern Ireland. That was one of the periods where we lost more people at any time. Now, part of that was probably anxiety about partition, but very, very, very much the economy. And don't forget, in that period, we have loads of people emigrating from the Britain as well. And there's all kinds of emigration schemes, the Empire Settlement Act and so on. Unemployment rates, when we take a look at them in that decade, if we go back and look at the picture. We have to be careful with the data because it's measured quite differently in terms of the 1920s, who was eligible to be insured and so on was a lot different than what is now. But even taking a basic look, you can see the massive unemployment rates in Northern Ireland in that decade that would have caused that massive outflow of the 1920s, regardless of whether it was political instability. Um, unemployments in the 50s, if we take a look at another snapshot, um, again, they're much, much, Northern Ireland is much, much higher than, than mainland GB and the UK overall. So the picture in Northern Ireland, even in the 1950s, which is considered a fairly positive decade for Northern Ireland, you know, unemployment was still an issue. Um, in the 70s, it, it just goes off, the, it starts going off the scale again. Not as bad as the 1920s, but you know, it's going off the scale, and of course we have the political unrest. So if we take a look at just things in comparison, we begin to get a flavor of why people might have left, and maybe also why in those particular decades we had very little immigration in those periods, but we did have some. We always have some immigration, we always have some emigration. Um, so, you know, people ask, well, how many Catholics, and the body count, how many Protestants, and so on. And we can see that in the 1960s and 50s, and really up until the 1980s, what we have is a picture of higher Catholic immigration. Um, and, but the, the 1970s is, since after the 1920s, is the big decade of, of, of emigration, and very likely, very poor economy, followed from the conflict, etc. Um, it's been argued in various ways. Um, if we go into the 1980s and the 1990s, what's that looking like? Well, we have approximately 10 to 15,000 people are departing per annum, but it begins to reverse. We have more Protestants going than Catholics in the, in, in the, in the balance, and particularly what we have is university students uh, or university students and uh, young skilled, but we also always have a stream of low skilled people who are going. And where are they going in these periods? Well, I'll get to that. 1990s, what we have are almost equal numbers of people coming in and out from various countries, including the Northern Ireland born people. And it sort of masks actually what the, um, what the actual figures are for those who are leaving. Um, but it's around 20 to 22,000 in and out each year. Um, by 1997, where do we, we begin to have more immigration starts to happen. Um, you can see that by 1997, 1.5% of Northern Ireland population is what we call minority ethnic groups. By 2011, with all the big influx of immigration, it's only up to 1.8%. It's very significant and it's very important, but it's no reason to, for people to strike out uh, in any kind of racist backlash and fear of, 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 of other people. So during the period, we have a lot, though, in interestingly, increasingly voiced concerns about racism attacks and, and problems with mi migrant workers are stealing our jobs and all this type of inflammatory sort of media. Um, in actual fact, where's the truth in all of this? Mm, yeah, exactly. So when we look at, say, Northern Ireland, even today, so what we're looking at is 
4.5% of the Northern Ireland foreign-born population um, is, um, is, has not been born in Northern Ireland, foreign-born. Now, that includes myself, actually, because although I'm a uh, Northern Ireland background, my parents are from Belfast, I was actually born in Canada, so that, that statistic would include people like me. But half of them are Europe, and about 2% are actually that post-EU new migrants. But if we look comparatively at the UK, it's 13% uh, overall. So where did our brightest young talent go? 19, if we look at 1920s numbers, who were these people? I want to put faces on some of them. Well, one of them was my granny, Rosina. And she was actually a returned migrant. Yes, people, even in the 1920s, went off, had two years abroad in Canada, and decided not for them, and came back, and got married here. Her brother, however, went off to California, and he stayed there for the rest of his life. So they're part of that. Leo... Uh, who I interviewed, uh, lives, uh, who's passed away now, I interviewed him in the 1990s, living in Ottawa, from Castle Derrick, left in 1926, again, to seek his adventure, but mostly for employment. There was no employment in the West Tyrone uh, in the 1920s. It was very little, and it was very tough. So where are these, you know, one of the places we can look at the census of England and Wales and Scotland give us good ideas about how many people were going in certain periods for which we don't have good figures. And we look at the Northern Ireland-born people. And we can see even uh, when we first get figures for England and Wales, you can see how much of that Irish ethnic group right through, if we look at the bright yellow stripes, how much of that ethnic group is actually of Irish ethnicity is actually born in Northern Ireland. Uh, it does give us an idea about, how, about the numbers. We don't have good numbers for the 1920s, but we see exponentially by 1931, we see this massive amount of people born in the six counties. Um, so some of the things. There were lots of things attracting people to emigrate. This, this advertisement appeared in a whole load of papers in Northern Ireland and also in Britain, but uh, very particularly the, it was in the Lisburn Gazette, it was in a whole load of papers, and they were actively in Canada trying to attract people from 1900. And a huge load goes out before First World War. And this uh, is very important because the 1920s people all have ha family, basically, when they're going out. Most of them all have family connections. And it's from this massive migration that happens from Britain in general, from the UK in general, in, uh, up until 1913, between 1902 and 1913. A lot of it to Canada, very particularly. Much of it to the empire because they're offering deals. They're offering assisted emigration. Um, by the time we get to 1922, yes, empire migration is a big thing, and it's a big thing for Northern Ireland. And the new Northern Ireland is party to empire migration. People are going to Australia, they're going to Canada, they're getting their passage paid, they're getting all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of benefits to go. Um, and Canada is dying to get, they don't have enough people, they're dying to get people to populate the Canadian West. So they're, they're not just advertising in Britain, they're advertising, as you can see from this postcard, um, you probably can't see Antwerp, Glasgow, Manchester, Newcastle, Naples, Italy, uh, Paris, and Dublin. Or not, Dublin's not on this one, but they were advertising Dublin. So um, you can see the countries. They're going for quite a lot of different countries. So there's a lot of come on out to Canada. They also wanted women. There was a tremendous shortage of women in the empire destinations. And you see this in the immigration data of those countries. There's this fear of not having enough women, despite the, the casualties of First World War even in some of those places, like in particularly Australia and Canada. Um, so if we look at where are, we only have data for overseas migrants. We don't have the data of the migrants going to Britain. That's where we, need, we look at the England and Wales and Scotland census of 31. But if we look at this, um, we can see where are they going. The, main, the majority of them, about 50%, are going to Canada. And some are going to the US. And a lot of it is families, like the Monteith family. Again, this family, coincidentally, also from Castle Derrick, who went out in April 1929. The Canadian government and the Northern Ireland government actually trained workers with, they turned the Rich Hill Castle into the Richmond Centre for Overseas Settlement and trained uh, workers and paid their passage out to Canada and some to Australia. So who are some of these, even in our brightest young talent? Well, some of them are, there's some of our post-war emigrants and a couple of returnees, uh, one's myself, 1970s and 80s emigrants here that I interviewed, and some of our immigrants and ethnic minorities, all part of our brightest young talent. So who are these people? If I, if I did a summary, we have interwar period laborers and domestics, uh, but that is unreliable. Lots of families, post-war skilled trades uh, tend to take over because a lot of the countries like Canada had began to have selection policies uh, for skilled migrants, so they were preferring skilled migrants. It was easier to get in if you had skills. Um, 
two streams in the 1970s, 1990s, the students and young graduates, what we call the brain drain, and has generated a bit of fear around that, and always a scale of low, of low skilled. And 2000s, what, we've, what we're seeing, increasingly families are added to the streams of students and low skilled, both for emigration and for emigration. And I won't go through these occupation, some of this by denomination overall, we're looking at about over the century, probably around 60% um, Catholics uh, versus Protestants in terms of the Northern Ireland born. Is there a discourse of migration? In interwar period, what are they talking about? You know, John Martin, Mark Unionist MP, Londonderry, of a certain religious persuasion, over 2,000 had emigrated during the last three months. A very large proportion of these young men of the farming industry, farmers' sons who are the very backbone of our country. And by our, our persuasion in that area, we are talking about Protestant young men, is the concern there. And, but on the other hand, um, some, of, some of the MPs were, um, oh, you know, we, it's important to have an outpost population. We need these connections. We need this, what we didn't in those days call diaspora. Um, what's Craig saying? Very interesting. Um, good connection. Influx of good British blood these countries need. And if the country at home does not pay attention, there's always the chance that by foreign blood, and in Canada by American blood, my goodness, uh, they might be getting the whole country into mortgage. So Canada is seen very much as part of, Northern Ireland as very much an, an, an imperial identity as part of this greater British family. Um, Thomas Henderson, an independent unionist, so what, thousands of young men went out from Ulster, are now derelicts in the industrial cities of Canada, and they cannot even get home. In the parks of Canada, there are large numbers of young men lying at nights in utter starvation. And I'm thinking of, if any of you saw Fergal Keane's program last night, some of that might you know, resonate. But this is 1926 we're talking here. So some of this type of stuff, Joe, Joe Devlin is, is, is beside himself as nationalist MP that the fact that they are subsidizing uh, to train people to emigrate from Northern Ireland with our Rich Hill uh, Castle scheme with Canada and should not be training people. Great rich countries like Canada should be able to pay their own. Dara Chichester, again a child herself of empire born in India, talks about the empire of we are part, where, you know, we, we, the call of the blood. So what happens in post-war? What happens when, the, particularly in 1962, when the census results of 1961 hit the fan? What happens when we discover that almost 100,000 people, young people, young, mostly skilled people from Northern Ireland have left? And we know in that group, for example, this really highlighted the, the, the Catholics that had left, particularly at that time. So Cara Healy brought this up in Stormont um, when, at the release of the results. Um, quiet and drastic discrimination is going on in regard to one class of people of the six counties. Catholic young men are being pushed out of the six county, counties for lack of work, houses, any chance of employment or on public boards. Plain truth is Catholics are obliged to quit having neither work nor home. What's Terence O'Neill's response to that as Minister of Finance? He, he puts it down to the influence of television and the happy portrayal of life on British TV, on, on new, remember how new television is at this point, um, is attracting people away from rural depopulation and rural areas, and not just out of the country, but to particularly the, the big cities of Britain. So what's the discourse of recent migration then? Really, I think overall it has been a discourse of immigrant others. Fear and intolerance of migrants, as in the wider UK context, generated in part, it has to be said, by the media. But overall, in Northern Ireland, really uh, almost a complete silence over the entire 90 years on emigration and what's happening to our young people today. So in summary, has there been a discourse of NI migration? I would say yes, uh, there, there well, maybe a lack of. So relative silence on migration, especially emigration. The avoidance, perhaps, and I, I posit this, of a failed state narrative. And it's interesting what's happening in the Irish Free State at that time, because, uh, and, and actually, and then into the Republic. Again, they're dealing with a different type of failed state narrative that they're trying to avoid with their masses of emigration. Is there a Northern Ireland diaspora? I pose that question, because there's all this discomfiture with the diaspora. Um, Non-cooperation on co cross-border diaspora initiatives, for example, the gathering, we've just got the figures in from that. Um, why didn't we participate in it in Northern Northern Ireland, uh, could we have benefited, should we have benefited? Um, could NI immigrants, what I've previously called a reluctant diaspora, be relied upon to support the state? So I think there's been always a suspicion of the people who left, rather than because, you know, maybe they're not pro-unionist. It doesn't suit pro-union pro administrations for a start. Um, immigrant others, unfortunately, viewed as a problem. 
Like emigrants, they are not valued for the potential they might offer in connecting Northern Ireland to other places, other ideas, other ways of doing and being uh, that we really need probably to learn from. So bringing you back to looking at it, I know that's been a very flying kind of coverage. Is emigration or, or dirty we seek it? Do we need to consider how our people born here, their experiences of going out to other places and how they did, uh, did that, some of them came back, brought skills and whatever. And think of all the people that come and go here um, in a different light and thinking of it of a longer term and maybe not panicking on these you know, short term, what really is, has been in the history of Northern Ireland an immigration anomaly. Yes, let's do our best, but let's not bring fear and racism and panic into it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.